membacakan susunan acara sebagai berikut. Yang pertama, sambutan. Yang kedua, sesi materi. Yang ketiga, sesi tanya jawab. Dan yang terakhir, penutup. Memasuki acara pertama yakni sambutan oleh Ketua Departemen Sejarah FIB UGM kepada Bapak Dr. Abdul Wahid, waktu dan tepat dipersilakan. Tidak tahu ini tentang untuk siapa Apakah memang kita mengakui Oh oke okay, akhirnya Belanda mengakui Mereka telah menjajah kita Dan kemudian uh, apa namanya Akhirnya mengakui kemerdekaan Indonesia itu adalah 17 Agustus 1945 Bukan 29 Desember 1949 uh, Tapi yang ingin saya sampaikan Yang ingin kita tekankan <tuh> Pengakuan tersebut Muncul ataupun di diambil Oleh pemerintah Belanda Setelah uh, selesainya sebuah penelitian skala besar yang mencoba meneliti kembali, memahami kembali proses sulit dari uh, proses ya dalam wacana internasional disebut dekolonisasi tahun 1949. Uh, jadi uh, pengakuan tersebut diambil setelah ada bukti-bukti empiris yang menunjukkan bahwa memang uh, Belanda berada dalam sisi sejarah yang salah, Dan kemudian juga melakukan banyak uh, kekerasan ya, yang, yang, yang secara hukum internasional pun itu tidak bisa dibenarkan. Dan yang lebih penting lagi yang ingin saya tekankan bahwa proses penelitian tersebut itu melibatkan Departemen Sejarah. Ya, kami dengan sangat bisa mengatakan sangat berbangga mengatakan bahwa Penelitian tersebut tidak akan sampai kepada keputusan atau kesimpulan yang seperti sekarang kalau tidak ada peran dari kita, ya, peran dari UGM atau dari pihak Indonesia. Ya meskipun kita menyebut UGM, sebenarnya kita juga uh, merekrut ataupun juga mengikut sertakan para peneliti dari 
lembaga-lembaga lain dan universitas-universitas lain di Indonesia. Tapi overall, saya ingin mengatakan bahwa UGM selalu berada di dalam uh, pusat uh, produksi dan juga wacana internasional di bidang kajian sejarah. Uh, dan kita selalu uh, menjadi partner, selalu menjadi pihak yang ditanya ketika ada uh, apa namanya kajian-kajian internasional, khususnya tentang Indonesia, tapi juga tentang negara-negara uh, uh, kasus yang lainnya. Jadi uh, saya menyampaikan itu, ya untuk teman-teman yang baru masuk itu sebagai orang pesantren yang punya harus minima sebagai rasa syukur dan juga terima kasih dan juga pride kita kalau kita memang uh, di, sangat di, diperhitungkan dalam dunia internasional dari sisi akademik. Jadi uh, uh, dan mungkin di Fakultas Ilmu Budaya hanya kita yang memulai uh, program perdananya dengan menghadirkan uh, para uh, ahli ahli. Saya sekali lagi ingin mengucapkan selamat datang kepada teman-teman mahasiswa baru uh, Harus dijadikan ini adalah sebuah awal yang fresh bagi kalian Untuk ke menimba ilmu pengetahuan di lembaga ini Kalian keluar baru kita Dan kemudian jangan pernah sungkan untuk bertanya Untuk ke, apa namanya untuk berproses uh, Bisa kepada kakak-kakak kelas maupun yang lain Juga kepada siapapun juga kepada para dosen Baik, uh, semoga uh, kuliah perdana ini bisa memberikan banyak uh, informasi dan pengetahuan baru untuk kita. Dan seperti itu sekali lagi terima kasih Ibu uh, Profesor uh, McGregor atas kesediaannya uh, memberikan kuliah di pagi hari ini. Terima kasih. Itu saja dari saya. Selamat mengikuti kuliah perdana ini. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Baik, terima kasih atas sambutannya Bapak Wahid Acara selanjutnya yaitu sesi materi yang akan disampaikan oleh Prof. Kate McGregor Dengan lecture bertajuk Memory and New Form of Indonesia Engagement with Colonial History Dalam sesi kali ini kita akan dipandu oleh Dr. Widya Fitrianingsi Selaku moderator Kepada Prof. Kate M. Gregor dan Dr. Widya Fitrianingsi, waktu dan tempat dipersilahkan. the areas of Southeast Asian history, the history of violence and Asian uh, thematic history. Dan banyak sekali uh, artikel dan juga buku yang ditulis oleh Bukit uh, juga nanti akan kita gunakan sebagai referensi di uh, banyak uh, mata kuliah kita. Salah satunya misalnya sejarah Indonesia ber, uh, berseragam dan juga masih banyak lagi. Uh, tanpa uh, memperpanjang waktu, uh, saya persilahkan Ibu Kit, please, time is yours. Terima kasih banyak Mbak um, Widya dan terima kasih Pak Wahid. Uh, saya mengucapkan terima kasih atas kesempatan uh, mengajar hari ini. Ini satu kehormatan untuk saya untuk membagi penelitian saya. Actually, I'm going to speak in English for most of the talk <laughs> to test your English skill. But if you would like to ask me questions in English, in Indonesian, please do. Yeah.
Okay, hopefully this is loud enough. Okay, so I wanted to say a little bit first about my own research journey so you understand that the focus of a lot of my research has been on memory, and that's what I'm talking about today. So, as about media mentioned before, I started by researching actually the Indonesian military and the way that they present history. And then I worked a lot on 1965, and particularly in memories of 1965 in Indonesia, which became very contested after the fall of Sahara. But more recently, I've also been working on topics related to gender and violence, and I've just published that book at the end called Systemic Silencing, Memory, Activism, Activism and Sexual Violence in Indonesia, which is actually about the Indonesian comfort women, Yuki Nanfu, and the story of activism and memory in relation to death. So, right now, I'm working on another project, and the topic of the project is called Submerged Memory. Um, this is a four-year project funded by the Australian government, and we're looking at how colonialism is remembered in Indonesia and also in the Netherlands, and sometimes by Indonesians and Dutch people together. And I'm working on this project with my collaborator at the University of Melbourne, Associate Professor Anna Drodlevich, and also Dr. Grace Malastana, Investor Malan, and a research assistant in the Netherlands. If you want to find out more about the project, you can look at our website. But what I'm presenting today actually comes from that project. So that's a little bit of context for you. But I wanted to talk a little bit about memory because some of you are new history students, so maybe you haven't come across this concept yet. I used this definition here of memory being how a certain view of the past is incorporated or sustained or alternatively eclipsed in millions of the present at individual and social levels. So when I'm talking about memory, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, when I teach memory at my own university, I always tell students that there are key questions we always ask in memory studies, and these are the key questions that always guide what we're looking at. Who is doing the remembering? And when is the remembering occurring? So time is very important in memory. So right now, I'm looking at very recent engagement with colonial history. So it's important to understand the context in which people are remembering. The next one, what is remembered? So we pay attention to what is remembered uh, and why, but also what is forgotten, because there is always forgetting alongside remembering. One scholar, Astrid Earl, said that uh, memory uh, is a small island in the sea of forgetting. And also, finally, I like to consider what are the effects of remembering or forgetting, maybe on particular individuals, maybe on a larger community. Another point that I didn't include there is that it's sometimes also very important to pay attention to where uh, remembering is occurring, particularly if it's occurring at a site of memory, or maybe it involves particular geographies as well. Also, in my research, I find two other concepts around memory that are very useful. One is transcultural memory, which refers to the fact that remembering doesn't occur in a container within one nation. Uh, a lot of early memory studies suggested that memory only occurred within one nation. But now I think that the concept of transcultural memory better captures what happens. Memory, in fact, continually travels uh, and it goes through ongoing transformations through time and space across social, linguistic and political borders as well. So for some of my case studies, this concept of transcultural memory is very useful. For others, where you see people engaging with the past for the purposes of trying to change state narratives, the concept of memory activism might be more apt. It refers to the strategic commemoration of a contested past outside of state channels to influence public debate and policy. So if you can just hold those concepts in your head, I'll return to them when I'm talking through my case studies today. Okay, so now, what do I include in the concept of colonial history? Maybe that seems like a simple question. Temporarily, so time-wise, I actually include the period of the VOC until the very present in terms of remembering colonial history. Why do I include the VOC era? Because although the VOC is considered a trading company, in many of 
respects, it also functioned like a state. Um, it had its own army, it occupied foreign territories, and it built strongholds in order to achieve profit, uh, and also conducted diplomatic work. So I see the VOC as part of the colonial period. But colonial history might also include engagement with uh, frames of memory that could be considered colonial, that might date back to the colonial period, but in fact persist until today. So it might include, for example, narratives about colonial modernisation or progress, especially that erase colonial violence and imperialism. So when I look at these examples of engagements with colonial history, I pay attention to the concept of coloniality, which refers to the systemic nature of colonialism, the structures of power and control that underpinned colonisation, which persist to the present, because they are also sometimes replicated. And also, across my research, I've also been looking for more innovative, interesting uh, memory work that engages in decoloniality, which for me involves cultivating, cultivating an ongoing dismantling of the lingering presence of colonial structures and thinking. <clears throat> Again, so I hope this will become clearer as I talk through the paper. So in the project that Dr. Arna Dravovic and I are working on at the moment, we focus on remembrance and memory related to initiatives pretty much in the last 10 years. Now the last 10 years has been a very interesting period to analyse. As uh, Awahid alluded before, there's been a lot going on with regard to colonial memory work. But it's also now 25 years after the new order regime in which history was very tightly controlled so I think, in general, there's been greater Indonesian engagement with history. The case studies that I'm going to focus on today are linked through an emphasis on how aspects of colonial history related to trade in commodities are remembered in Indonesia today. So I'm looking at what are the new trends in memory and remembrance, and to what extent in Indonesian memory work uh, is, is Indonesian memory work related to colonialism also critical of colonialism. So I'll be presenting on three case studies uh, which are different kinds of engagement with colonial history. The first is on Museum Lukubunan from Medan, which is a museum. The second is the Banda Journal, which is a photo documentary project. And the third is an artistic work, an installation called Monuments, which was part of a European festival called Europalia. So before I talk a little bit more about Museum Lukabunan, I need to make a few comments about museums and their relationship to colonialism. Museums were a key instrument for perpetuating colonialism, especially through the narratives they told and the way in which the collections were acquired and also collected and then also narrated. In Indonesia, following independence, some museums used the same collections the Dutch had gathered and told new stories about these collections. But some scholars, including many Indonesian scholars right now, are asking the question to what extent these museums have been decolonised. Further to this, when we think about entirely new museums that have been created more recently, to what extent can those museums also escape colonial framings, given the history of museums as an institution? Indeed, one leading museum scholar, Sumaya Kasim, has asked, can the museum ever be decolonised? So the Museum of Gubuna, that I'm going to talk about now, is a particular kind of museum which I would categorise as a commodity museum. Commodity museums seem to be a newer trend in Asia today. Generally, they focus on telling the story of an industry and sometimes that includes celebrating the history of this industry. In this process, the Indonesian nation is still often evoked to provide a sense of a shared history. But there is a strong emphasis on a narrative of development and trade in commodities and therefore largely on capitalist values. Now, museums often give the impression of being very authoritative. If you walk into a museum and you don't normally see a sign saying this person designed the collections of this museum. 
So the authority of museums is often assumed. It's assumed to be an authoritative version of the past. But of course, there are always people behind museums. And asking the memory question, we must always return to ask who is doing remembering. So this museum here that I'm going to talk about is located on the outskirts, outskirts of Medan, and it's part of a larger complex of Kalabasawi research. So Kusat Kalikian Kalabasawi, or the Oil Palm Science Techno Park. This institution does research to service not only the government, but also private industry. And um, I think it could be considered pretty much a government museum. Um, and it draws attention also, our attention to the location of this museum being in Medan, which is very close to a lot of plantations as I'll discuss in a minute. The building in which the museum is housed um, is part of the former Avros company, uh, a company of Smartrum rubber planters actually originally that was designed by an art, a Dutch architecture. This museum building, which is part of one much larger complex, specifically housed uh, the residence of the former uh, colonial company Avros as director. So this makes the museum a direct site of memory. It's important to note that this museum only recently opened, so the 10th of December 2016. And I don't have sufficient information yet to know why it was created at this time, but it might be part of the effort by the city government of Medan to expand the tourist attractions and the local identity of the city of Medan, as we've seen in many other cities across Indonesia. <clears throat> So there has been national funding also provided for cities to make attractions in their own cities. So let's have a look at the dedication plaque on the outside of the museum. The dedication plaque always tells us something about the mission of a museum. So you can read uh, that plaque there on the left. So you can see a reference there to dreams, um, and also to the ideals uh, that they want to achieve. In the museum pamphlet, they also highlight the theme of the museum as being to connect the past to the future. When we're dealing with memory, memory looks back, but it also looks forward, uh, and this is the case in the museum. It's trying to inspire particular values looking towards the future. Also, in the museum pamphlet, uh, it's presented that the aim here was to present the long journey of the plantation for achieving success and being able to anticipate future challenges for the nation state of Indonesia. So, uh, there's an emphasis here on history and the story of success of the nation. The organisation that oversaw this uh, planning and invitation for the museum was the Plantation Foundation, headed by Sujati Katasasmita. He is 96 years old today uh, and is described in the museum pamphlet as Toko Pukubuna. He formerly worked as a plantation manager in some of the largest government and private plantations. So let's now take a look at how history is presented in this museum. Particularly, I'm only focusing on how the colonial era is presented. There is actually some attention to modern history too. Okay. So, uh, to begin with, one of the very first panels in the museum, um, the timeline, it's labelled Era Pra Colonia. Do you see any problems with this labelling Era Pra Colonia? Anybody want to respond? What does that imply if you call this period Era?
does that imply to you, these captions? Anybody want to comment?
is not critical at all. It's very positive framing in the relationship between the development of plantations and you know, these thriving cities. There's a focus solely here on production, you know, uh, the number of um, the Minka. And the visual image, as I mentioned, also very much emphasizes, you know, a kind of thriving colonial city. After this opening, the museum offers a series of panels telling visitors more about the most important natural commodities in Indonesia, like sugar, coffee, tea, cocoa, and palm oil. And across these displays, several trends are visible. The first is an emphasis on capitalist competition with the outside world. For example, in the case of Kalapa Sawi, one panel reads, at the time of World War II, Ind Indonesia was the largest producer of palm oil. It was overtaken by Malaysia for several decades, <clears throat> but in 2007 it returned to the position of the best. So, sense of pride here, um, pride in again the level of production in Indonesia. And across the panels of each commodity, <clears throat> let's see. Another trend that we see <coughs> is an emphasis on what I call commodity labor. So, across the museum, there's great attention to men in history, including interestingly Dutch men, with an emphasis on their role in developing a commodity or trading it. The panels celebrate Karel Albert Rudolf Boscher, the founder of the Malaba Bandung tea plantation. He also founded two tea factories there and also founded ITV, the school that was the basis of ITV. There's a whole panel also in the middle there on Jakob Ninus, a tobacco planter in East Java. Um, and the caption reads, history records that Ninus was a person who was renowned in the field of tobacco plantations. One panel also mentions a key Indonesian sugar trader called Wichaham, who was known as the Sugar King. So across the panels, there's an emphasis on commodity men as the drivers of progress in Indonesia. And a large section of the museum is devoted to Sumatra's famous tobacco plantations, which is understandable given the museum is located in Medan. And a map on display reminds people just how many plantations there were in this area formerly called East Sumatra. And it is also emphasized again that through trade in tobacco, um, this contributed greatly to building the city of Medan. And you can see here a former colonial image of tobacco shop. So on one panel, it is said that um, the area of North Sumatra and around it was built by the popularity of Delhi tobacco. And that tobacco made this an international region. One panel reports on the fame of the Delhi cigars. The Delhi tobacco plant, it is told, visitors are told, was actually called the tree of golden leaves. So again, there's a focus here on making uh, how much money the plantations actually made. But again, I guess it's not questioned for who and who are underpinned or what underpinned that process. So very interestingly, the only women who are mentioned in this museum are women workers, and they are only visually depicted. There is no naming or narration of these women. So across the extensive displays on tobacco, uh, there is some attention, as I said, to Indonesian women in history. Um, but they are treated as subjects and Ruth India Rahayu, an Indonesian historian, argues that lower class women are frequently marginalised in Indonesian history. And I think it's interesting that again, women workers of a particular class are visible but not really visible or individualised in this museum. So the first woman to appear in the museum is actually Dira. It's not any specific woman, it's just showing us a worker. In other sections of the museum, many photographs of women workers from the colonial era are also on display. And again, most of those photographs have actually been sourced from the digital collections of Leiden University or from KRTLB Leiden collections online. 
The images show us women at work picking, sorting, and drying tobacco leaves. The colonial origin of these photographs, however, and why they were taken, is not reflected on at all. Um, and there's also some photos, I should say, of modern day women workers as well. But as I mentioned, none of these workers are individualised in the museum. So none of them are named, no details are given about them. In addition, there's no text provided to explain or indeed offer any criticism of the often oppressive conditions of workers in this industry. Now there is historical work on this topic of plantation workers and their plight in the colonial and independent periods, including the work, for example, of Anne Stoller, Hilma Fadi, Grace Lexana, but a choice has been made here not to narrate anything about the workers. So the aspects of workers' lives are mostly presented only through visual images, but also through some very interesting objects. So the most interesting thing in the whole museum for me, actually, was these records on the left, which are actually documents of the fingerprints of workers taken from the colonial period. And each sheet displays the fingerprints as well as the notes of each worker's distinguishing physical features, their place of origin, their ethnicity and gender, and whether they have ever engaged in bad behaviour like theft or insubordination. There's also handwritten notes at the end of these forms. And according to the museum guide, there's actually hundreds of records like this, and they do plan to list them with UNESCO, but not largely for the, what the records say, but largely as the history of technology of fingerprints. These could actually be very fascinating records for a historian to study, um, but unfortunately at this stage there isn't much written explanation about what these records actually tell us about the ways in which labourers labors were surveyed and controlled. And in those ways, the heart of the power and the process of exploitation that accompany colonialism are silenced. Two other displays also hint at the oppressive conditions of workers, including practices of labour control. So one cabinet, for example, shows us coins here. <clears throat> and those coins were shaped in a particular way with particular stamps and were only to be used on one plantation so that they would restrict labour mobility so you couldn't move between plantations and you made money at one plantation or you had to spend money at one plantation. So nobody could get out or also spend their money somewhere else. Another display finally features a replica small model of housing given to contract workers. Uh, these were three by three rooms with bunk beds, but we were told by the guides that these were only the rooms for the more elite workers. The ordinary workers were actually in different barracks, but that was not to be shown because it was six So when I asked why there were no stories of the workers, you know, on the streets, for example, it was mentioned that there were some documentaries about that. It was as if their stories did not have a place in this museum. So overall, the museum focuses on a very positive narration of this history that is not critical at all of any person or any aspect of the plantation system because of the mission of the museum to present a story of success of the Indonesian nation. So in summary, it was said that this museum presents an overall narrative of teleological progress, by which I mean everything is always getting better. And there's a kind of seamless line between the Dutch colonial period right through to the present, and an emphasis on the important role of commodities in Indonesia, on commodity men, and also on the story of Indonesian global trade dominance. So what is we, we to make of this museum? One way of considering the Plantation Museum is a museum that emphasizes both commodities, but also global markets and trade. Reflecting on museums in a totally different context in the important trading city of Bristol in the UK, Alex Gapud observes that in this museum, positive narrations of the history of trade work as, quote, a significant mode of displacement which silences problematic and uncomfortable histories of empire that potentially contradict a celebratory narrative of city and nation, end quote. So Gapud argues that the term trade is underpinning this whole museum can function as a depoliticization in that it evokes equality, like trade between who? Was everybody equal? But what are the in trade? But also concealing processes of violence, exploitation, and inequalities of power. So there's inequalities of power clearly present between the workers and the companies or the persons that oversaw them, the commodity men. 
So in the case of the Plantation Museum, what is at stake here in the concealment of, for example, you know, several processes and underpinning plantations is, I guess, the very links or continuities between practices of labour exploitation in the colonial era until the present day, but also perhaps to the image of the city of Nedan. So I now want to turn to an example of a very different and far more reflective form of Indonesian engagement with memory of colonialism, specifically the period of the BSC. Before I do that, um, I need to do talk a little bit about the Banda Massacres, because I'm going to talk about a project that came out of the 400 year anniversary of the Banda Massacres. And that project uh, started really with the history of violence, so it's a very different starting point to the history of the Museum of Wuhan. So in 1621, as you might already know, the VOC commander, Yang Yuxin carried out a massacre of Bundanese people in pursuit of the trade of the spice nutmeg. The reason the VOC was determined to secure this monopoly um, was that it was valued medicinally in most parts of the world. It reached a very high price traveling between the Banda Islands where it was grown back to the trade markets of Europe. In Europe, it was primarily sought after, however, as a spice. So nutmeg was so valuable at the time that each time it changed hands between one person to another, it increased its value by 100%. The Dutch here were also seeking to push out the Portuguese and British from East Indonesia in order to secure this monopoly of nutmeg. So basically, global capitalism and competition was the driver behind this violence. In 1621, Kuhn sailed to the islands with an army of 1,655 Europeans um, who joined 250 Dutch men already at the garrison and 286 Japanese convicts and 80 to 100 Japanese mercenaries. So following an incident that was interpreted as a sign of a planned Londonese attack on the Dutch, on May 8, 1621, 44 prisoners, including Orenkaya, were brutally beheaded and quartered. And after their villages were razed to the ground, some Bundanese fled to the exposed hills away from the nutmeg plantations. They refused to pick the crops, and under these conditions, some people also died from exposure, starvation, and disease, while others were rounded up and shipped to Batavia as enslaved persons. Des Alwi, the story of the Banda Islands, estimates that around 6,000 Bundanese people were actually killed in this period of violence. And about 1,700 also fled to the Kiai and Saram Islands and other places. Now, up until the 1850s, the Dutch state continued to make vast, vast sums of money for the control of the Banda Islands and related trade in nutmeg. Although nutmeg still grows in the Banda Islands today, they're mostly known as a tourist destination with a beautiful sea life and small good there. So now, now let's turn to looking at the project about the Banda Islands, the Banda Journal. The Banda Journal was published in 2021 and it was produced by a journalist and a photographer who generally work for um, big magazines, including international magazines and also Indonesian magazines. So it was produced by two West Sumatrans, interestingly. A West Sumatran journalist, Fatris MF, and also a West Sumatran photographer, Mohamed Fadli. And this, however, was an independent and self-funded project. So again, when we think about who's doing the remembering, we also need to think about what's behind the remembering. Is there a government? Is there an institution? Is this privately funded, personally funded? This was published by the publication Jordan, which is a Jakarta-based independent publisher, which actually describes itself as publishing books that espouse critical and progressive thinking and which are not averse to confronting all censorship and limitations imposed by government. So the emphasis on this publisher, on it being independent and critical work is important in terms of the interesting frames that come out in work. So what kind of source is the London Journal? We could describe it as, and indeed the producers describe it as, a photo documentary project, which is distinguished from photojournalism by the length of time and related reflection that accompanied this pro project. So they actually worked on this project for seven years, between 2014 and 2021. The project consists of a photo and text-based publication entitled The Bundle Journal, but also a short documentary, Songs from Another Land, and the bilingual Indonesian English website. And the fact that it's bilingual, of course, again, tells us it's addressing not only Indonesian audiences, but also international audiences. 
So in terms of the intention of the project, um, it's also interesting to consider what mission the journal had. In their, one of the introductory remarks to the volume, they describe the Bunda Journal as highlighting the legacy of centuries-long colonisation and exploitation in the remote Indonesian Bunda Islands. I'm just going to flip to the web page and show you the text. I hope you can read it on the page. If you can read it, I'd like you to see the, the framing that they place on their members of the okay. Bible Did anybody want to comment on the words that you used to frame this project? If you can read it. what they meant for them. You know, this was an enormous effort maybe to get to these islands, but then what did they do when they came to the islands? They point to the capitalist exploitation of the VOC. They describe the VOC as the world's first, which is interesting because it's also alluding to the role of perhaps multinational corporations. And they also genocide and slavery. So very strong language for Budaka and Jacinta. Very different to the narrative found in Europe. So the work is European discovery in the commerce of the islands and the creation of the VOC is being considered important in history of globalization, right? But the price was extremely high as the They're doing through this I think is very importantly challenging what we might call a more golden age narrative about human discovery and the narrative that has been popular Some forts are literally facing each other. You can stand up and you can see each other. So the extent to which these forts also tell us how much uh, nutmeg was prized as a treasure to be guarded at all costs on the islands. Alongside these traces of colonial history, the authors provide portraits and poetry also on contemporary such as school plantation owners and workers and mission. In this way, Fudges and Bali Authority also emphasised how locals have continued to live in this area, but also the surrounding sea. Now there are also some references in the journal, but it's not all about the island. 
as an important period. But there are some references to how a lot of people also remember the messages. So there's one photograph here that shows um, the Bundanese on the Bundanese South Island commemorating massacre by Sandy looking out to the sea with bamboo poles that symbolize of the of the planet of the place. So it pays close attention to the community memory and knowledge production related to the masses in the short documentary film called Songs from Another Land. And this documentary feature film includes an interview with a descendant of the original community of Bangladesh who fled from Banda to Kaidasar. So I have a map there um, to show you um, the islands of Kai, the Kai Islands. Um, the tiny islands yeah, next to Arun. So these are the tiny islands, so some Bangladesh fled the masses and ended up settling on these islands. So they also have living memory of the masses. So the islands is located 300 kilometers actually to the south of the Banda Islands, um, and they established a new community there. So in the film, Song from Another Land, which you can also uh, watch on YouTube if you want to, in the community, Musikalata sings a few verses of a song in the original Bandanese to a wider language, emphasizing the endurance of the Bandanese culture. And when we interviewed the photographer Mohammed Fadli, he stressed the song is not like history and recorded in books, it is oral history. In this song, the Stika Lata performs, um, she narrates the story of her family's former village in the Banda Islands and the dramatic moments linked to the family's forced migration to the Kiai Islands following Kion's invasion in 1621. So obviously this memory has been passed down through songs in the family line for 400 years. The film and the oral testimonies within it serve as a means of joint knowledge production, which is much more towards the direction of decolonial memory. It also includes attention to um, the translocal, you know, between island remembrance of this history. The way in which this project was carried out also reflects important attention to decolonial practices. Both Fatris and Fadli, for example, visited the Banda Islands multiple times and stayed with community members, engaging in long conversations with them to understand both the history and present of the islands. The fact that they termed their work a journal also tells us that they viewed their work as a subjective representation rather than a single authoritative account, such as one in a museum. Again, this reflects a decolonial stance in the sense that they were not aiming to produce a new singular narrative of this history, but instead to draw attention to diverse aspects of the past. And in this way, I think we could consider this work an example of memory activism. This is a very important project, I think, um, by two non bandanese Indonesians to explore in greater depth the history and significance of the Banda massacres and the legacies of the VOC also from the perspective of different Bandanese communities. This project draws attention to much larger processes uh, such as modernity, colonialism and economic exploitation, highlighting the lasting impact of these processes and the violence that underpin them. This project could also be described, I guess, as an art intervention. And the scholar Sadia Munstro has also helped uh, to highlight the extent to which Indonesian artists have been at the forefront, actually, of efforts to offer new decolonial perspectives on Indonesian history and the legacies of colonialism. So in the final example that I'm going to present here, I'm going to speak about another artwork, the installation of the Indonesian visual artist Iswan Tunkatomo. This example of remembrance of colonial history is different from the two previous examples because the primary audience here was actually Dutch people. This was an installation that occurred in a Dutch institution, which I'll mention in a minute, so the memory here. So in 2017, Iswanto Hotono was invited to be part of Europalia, a Brussels-based biennial multidisciplinary festival. This festival includes music, visual arts, literature, dance, and much more. So in response to this invite, Hatono decided to create an installation called Monuments, like the old church in Amsterdam City. Through this installation, Iswanto explained he sought to make audiences aware of colonial history that is often consciously forgotten. And uh, this installation occurred in 2017. Could anybody think why in the year 2017 there might have been particular attention to monuments? Is anything else going on globally around 2017 that might direct attention to monuments? Um, 
been sought, sought to draw a direct link between colonial practices and the extremes of the sea, economic exploitation, and those of the new order, but potentially also to these ongoing processes, and maybe also the role of foreign businesses and corporate greed more generally. For Iswanto, the main purpose of this installation was to open critical conversations about the legacies and enduring patterns that have been carried forward well after the demise of colonialism. So some Dutch people in response to this exhibition were dismayed that this exhibition could be held in the old church because they saw the church as a symbol of Dutch glory. But for Iswanto, the main purpose was to again open these critical conversations about the legacies and patterns of colonial exploitation. And that includes also the pattern of extreme economic exploitation of the planet's resources. I think that's indicated in this display. While Iswanto's installation was not accompanied by any overt demands for Dutch accountability for the Banda Massacre, this transcultural memory project called upon audiences to consider the ongoing meaning of monuments and the celebration of particular past persons or prestigious of them. And um, one scholar of monuments, actually Abraham, highlights a key contemporary challenge for this generation, which means you, is the continued creative engagement with and rethinking of the monumentalization that shifts from just commemorating the simple and static narratives of the past towards, in the end, only a temporary exhibition, and of course, it vanished over time. So, in my articulations of colonial history, especially in the context of Dutch society, since the monument to Korn, the real one, still stands. At the very least, this project might have provoked some reflection um, on colonialism in Dutch society. So just in conclusion for my talk, um, I want to say that starting with our first example again, while Museum of Buddha in Indonesia reminds us that it is equally possible to uncritically replicate colonial narratives in contemporary memory work, Iswanto's installation and the Banda Journal suggests other newer patterns in memory work that critically considering the legacy of colonialism and the mentalities that accompany it. Both works importantly challenged any romanticized images of the link between the spice of trade and commodities with the Dutch Golden Age that is at least partially endorsed in Museum of Pokabuna. And the two latter projects, I think, also very interestingly move us beyond nationalist framings of Indonesian history because of the challenges they, they make to broader processes of exploitation. Um, not just by the Dutch, but more broadly and globally. These projects engage with the of colonialism to prompt critical reflection on the excesses of capitalism and economic exploitation. And these works are part of a larger group of works which my collaborator Anna Dragovic and I call Submerged Histories of Dutch Colonialism. These are histories that are not immediately visible nor recognisable in nationalist representations of the past, and they generally work to challenge colonial violence and economic exploitation. In the Indonesian context, a decolonial perspective, I also argue, requires attentiveness to the ongoing nature of colonialism and modernity, and also to related hierarchical dynamics of power. So, Kumpasi. Silahkan, please. 
one, two, and three. Ya, uh, tiga penanya untuk uh, kesempatan uh, pertama ya. Nah, silakan sebutkan nama dan uh, angkatan atau dari departemen. Uh, baik, terima kasih saya Taki Giza. Uh, sebelumnya saya pengus penyusup, saya dari tetangga sebelah bukan orang UGM, jadi mohon maaf. Uh, mungkin pertanyaan saya di uh, sehari-hari atau uh, ya berhubungan dalam media sosial. Jadi seingat saya kalau bukan uh, awal tahun ini atau tahun kemarin di media sosial Indonesia itu ada ramai uh, posting yang cukup uh, ramai, yaitu mengenai seorang uh, pria yang mengirimkan foto dia sedang berziarah ke makam keluarganya. Seingat saya itu kakeknya di Jakarta. Jadi keluarganya ini adalah seorang uh, prajurit kenil di era kolonial begitu. Di sana dia ya postingannya ingin menunjukkan kalau dia sedang bersiar ke sana begitu. Tapi ada banyak reaksi negatif terhadap uh, postingan tersebut begitu. Nah, se uh, saya juga jadi uh, terpanti ketika uh, ada kebohongan itu karena kebetulan uh, keluarga saya juga uh, ada yang menjadi pejabat di era kolonial begitu, uh, pegawai pemerintahan. Nah, apakah menurut uh, Buket Uh, apa memori-memori seperti ini juga bisa uh, apakah ini memori begitu ada apakah uh, it is worth uh, to be remember to be remembrance apakah uh, ya ini juga sesuatu yang harus di, diingat kemudian di, dikaji gitu karena memang uh, topik ini sering diangkat se sepenglihatan saya di, di, di internet Kemudian kedua, karena tadi uh, penjelasan pertama mengenai museum Sementara kita ada di Yogyakarta yang memiliki puluhan hingga ratus museum uh, Dan tadi juga membahas mengenai artikel dari Sumaya Kasim, ya, uh, kurator di Birmingham uh, Dengan adanya museum-museum yang terus mereproduksi narasi dominan atau kolonial uh, Sebut saja contohnya kalau di Yogyakarta itu Museum Soeharto gitu Apakah Uh, itu sebuah proyek ya, atau sebuah apakah etis di masa ini gitu untuk terlibat atau bekerja di museum yang mereproduksi narasi uh, kolonial ataupun uh, dominan ini sekadar pendapat dari mungkin saja mungkin seperti itu terima kasih Terima kasih atas contoh itu, atas kunjungan ke satu tempat makam orang kecil ya itu sangat menarik. Sebenarnya uh, awal tahun ini saya berkesempatan uh, keliling beberapa kota di Indonesia dan saya ikut beberapa tour uh, di Bandung. Saya ikut satu tour ke makam Belanda. Itu uh, diadakan oleh satu kelompok namanya Sejarah Bandung. But the tour was focusing on the Dutch cemetery, so still managed by the Dutch government, and there's a lot of graves in there to uh, soldiers from Kenil. Menurut saya, itu sangat penting untuk ingat orang itu. On the grave sites, it's also mentioned the ethnicity of the soldiers from Kenil. Of course, some of them are Dutch, but some are Ambanese, some are Javanese, all different kinds of ethnicities. But, mungkin, ya, sejarah itu is masih sensitif di Indonesia. Saya juga sempat tahun yang lalu untuk melihat eksibisi revolusi di Rijks uh, Museum di Belanda. Di dalam eksibisi itu ada beberapa fokus kepada satu prajurit Kenil dari latar belakang Ambon. Um, dalam masyarakat Belanda itu mungkin lebih gampang untuk membuka sejarah itu dan orang itu mencari pengakuan. Tapi di Indonesia kadang-kadang ini masih sensitif karena ada framing nasionalisme yang sangat kuat yang kejumuran untuk apa representasi sejarah dalam hitam putih you either with us or against us so Indonesians versus the Dutch but actually those categories were far more fluid and different during the revolution so I think that the whole revolution would really be historicized um, and some of the scholars at OPM are already doing this work but historicized with more attention to more marginal historical subjects who are not just the Puduang of the Teeri or whatever organization we're talking about the revolution also the histories of Indoor people in Indonesia we don't have enough histories of that community or of ethnic Chinese all of these groups could be considered to be marginal historical subjects 
So I will look up that media posting. That's very interesting. But um, I mean, yeah, I kind of mentioned you know living uh, with this history. Of course, there are people in Indonesia who live with this history, and these are their relatives. So why don't they deserve a place in the past? Um, I think one of the most important things is that history can also teach you maybe the values of humanism as well, not just nationalism, but humanism to the performance more often as well. Like. And this question about museums as well, you know, I don't think every museum is maybe as uh, replicating of colonial paradigms. Uh, the example I gave was maybe a bit extreme, but other museums, I think, could still do more work to be more critical. And again, this, this work is starting in Indonesia. The Ministry of Education is starting to work on a number of museums, even working with the collections that they have at the moment, adding new labels to think about where did this object actually come from, who acquired it, what power dynamics is behind it, or even does this object belong in this museum or maybe in a local community museum. Sometimes the problem might be who controls the museum and who gets a voice in the museum. In different museums across the world, like in my city in Melbourne, we have a museum of immigration. And that museum often holds exhibitions about migrant communities. Um, but that plays a very important role of giving a voice to one community in the country to tell their story, like the history of Vietnamese Australians, something like that. So it's also about how much control does the museum preserve does it allow an open space for other people to also you know, have a say? Or maybe there should be more community consultation. So I still maybe have some hope for Indonesian museums, but there needs to be more criticism and people need to be very aware of that history of museums. Sebelumnya perkenalkan nama saya Prasetyo dari angkatan 23. Uh, before thank you Profesor Ken uh, uh, to ask uh, I'm interested in the topic of museum decoration, which in my understanding in focus incorporating elements of culture from the Communist Party. Um, actually, I'm still confused about what is the actual definition of museum decoration is, and then the Kasim argues that museum will not be decolonized. Uh, it seems in the case of the Museum Perkebunan Medan, if that is true, why? With Museum Decolonization, wouldn't it decide the story more, more urgent? Project, please. Thank you. So, the first question is about what you would like me to clarify. What does museum decolonization mean? Is that right? Yeah? Um, well, I think I'd probably go back to the first slide where I had about coloniality, that it's important that the museum, if it wanted to decolonize, would definitely start to reflect on, well, on this, on coloniality. So it, it would include an awareness about the systemic nature of colonialism, the structures of power and control underpinning colonization. But if you just begin a narration, just this happened, and you don't tell the social context around it, you don't think about who was affected by something. Just focusing on the great men of history is a very old approach to history, in my view. Right? So in that museum, it's just history top down. So decolonizing museums would also include multiple perspectives, multiple narratives, right? So it's not just from the perspective of, um, you know, plantation owners, right? So it would include different perspectives. Um, I think that's one way that would be achieved. Um, what was the second question again? Uh, sorry, Eddie? Well, uh, I would actually love to do that museum myself. <laughs> Do it to do the museum again. I think there's a lot of interesting collections in that museum. But you know, why aren't the workers included in the story? They also created those plantations and continued to work on them. There could be fascinating stories there, but I wonder what they would say. Um, so maybe it's about controlling the story as well. How much power does the museum give to other voices? So in museums in Europe, 
these issues are very hotly debated because it's very clearly understood that you know these are imperial museums and very directly related to imperialism. So maybe the mission of decolonization is very clear and strongly demanded there. But in Indonesia, maybe the assumption is that if we tell a national story, that's already decolonized. But for me, decolonizing means not just a national story, but a story that reflects power and all levels of community, who's involved, and also thinking about how those structures of power continue to operate until today in back ops. Yeah, but there's a lot of interesting new scholarship about decolonizing museums, especially it focuses a lot on Europe though, so I'm trying to think, yeah, like you, what does it mean in Indonesia? I don't have all the answers yet. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, actually, I'm Tamim from the History Department in UKM. So, um, this is an interesting uh, presentation because uh, some of us are being challenged and to be more critical instead of just accepting the thing. So, uh, my uh, question is, when we go back to the presentation from the museum presence, uh, my assumption is that they wrote like that, it's because it's more easier to understand by the people. Like, because uh, I have the same problem today that I have faced. Like, I have an uh, ongoing project with um, uh, the government. Uh, so it's pretty hard uh, to, in parenthesis, educating people, like, uh, to be more critical, uh, just like that. And also, like, um, it is more easier for the people to understand because it's a common knowledge. And it has been teaching since elementary school, like instead, like okay, we have to be more critical, like yeah, such as like that. And also, I think it's also correlated with the museum workers uh, who wrote the narrative uh, that they got only minimum wage and the work isn't good enough. So just like that, it it is my assumption. But I think the narratives should have been more critical and the presentation that showing colonialism is more complicated and complex than it showed in a museum instead of like just like okay we have to write it down like this and that. Um, but also uh, my assumption is that also correlate to the monuments material and my question is why there's a lot of Sukarno monuments instead of Suharto that being held as the greatest president ever, or Pena Jaman Kuto phrase. Uh, like, the, it's more convenient in my presidency, is it? Uh, I think, uh, so we have to, like, it's not becoming a problematic issue in history or in past in general. So, like, it helps us to analyze and evaluate information, ideas, and situation. Like, enables also, like, uh, make informed decision, identify flaws, and avoid being misled. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments and questions. Yeah, I guess, as I said, like, we do need to consider who is behind the museum. I don't know if any historians were consulted. I actually need to an interview with the museum staff to find out more. Um, and the museum workers, you're right. But maybe we tell the narratives that we know, as you said. So how do you break those narratives? Memory is always produced in a social context, but it also relates to what discourses, what language you know uh, to analyze. So um, I heard secondhand in a paper yesterday that one of the presenters, I didn't get to hear it, that he had Edward Said and always made him think of that framing, you know? So I, I guess it's what you, what you learn, how you learn history and how you open your mind to other perspectives will enable you even as museum visitors to see these things, right? And then if you apply that in your work, hopefully a new generation will bring this uh, critical thinking. Uh, you know, I think that this work is about to begin in Indonesia or accelerate. Uh, I'm sure that it's about to happen and it'll be very interesting to watch, but you're right. Um, it just it makes me also think, well, the key man behind that museum is 96 years old. So he was sort of a certain generation, and he himself was Tokobunan. So maybe he sees, you know, that that's what you should write about, the Tokobunan, that's it, the commodity man, right? So every museum is also a product of who, who makes it. 
Um, but then I think, I don't know, the, you know, I wonder about museum engagement. What do people expect when they go to a museum? Would they be interested to hear the workers' stories? I'm not sure. But then maybe it assumes that nobody from the workers' families would ever go to the museum. So <laughs> is it only for elite people if only elite people are represented there? Or who is the museum for? So you're already catering to a particular audience by just focusing on elite people or the big men industry, big industry rather than, you know, of course, there'd be many generations of people who worked on the plantations too. So this is the process of inclusion and exclusion as well in terms of visitors. presentation. I really enjoyed it. But I think um, I'm particularly interested in the parts when, where you talked about monuments. Um, so like recently, um, for example, when we talk about the um, monument of Obuda Sandira and Bara in Jakarta, um, there's currently like an artwork in Art Jog. Um, so there's this Papuan artist, he built, like rebuilt the monument, but then as, for example, like he put um, dead bodies as the feet or like prison as the body to recontextualize the monuments instead of like destroying it. But also, in a sense, it's also building a monument to talk about the idea of liberation. Um, so I guess like in terms of monuments, I think it's always very like authoritative because in a sense like it's celebrating something and then there's only this like one narrative. Um, and I guess I really would like to know, like, what are your thoughts about monument itself? Like, should we move, for example, like, do we just stop building mon monuments altogether? Do we move maybe to, like, a more feminist mode of remembering, a maybe more immaterial mode of remembering? Um, and in terms of, like, let's say for some people, okay, we're not going to destroy, we're going to recontextualize. Um, but then, for example, when we look at the situation in Jogja, there are a lot of like tiny little monuments that are scattered everywhere. People don't even like commemorize it. We find like Padagang, Kakilima around it. When they're asked about what the monument is, they don't really have any, any idea. But then, um, so it kind of seems like is destroying monuments productive, but also where we have that possibility of someday like people being mobilized because of like the narration that is brought by the monument itself. So I guess like uh, I'm very curious of your thoughts about monuments or even the idea of monuments as a mode of remembrance. Thank you. Well, thank you for telling me about that example. That's very interesting. Kind of quite similar to this one to us work, like a temporary installation that critiques one monument that still stands. And you're right, monuments present a fairly singular view of the past, but they also, in a way, are erasing history there. And you know, this is a celebratory monument in Jakarta, but it could also be erasing histories of violence. Um, so you're right, monuments can be quite powerful in terms of their symbolism, and again, processes of exclusion and inclusion. Um, it's interesting though, uh, there are examples in Europe of some monuments where people have, over time, well before BLM and the Roads Must Fall matter, also used monuments as sites of protest. So I guess the meaning of a monument could change, and even having a monument there can be a site of protest or something you can engage with. Um, so there's a potential for monuments in that way, but what we've seen over hundreds of years of history is generally monuments are built to celebrate particular individuals um, and often people who've done questionable deeds. And in the context of, for example, America, where there might be Confederate monuments, the complaint of people in contemporary society or in my own country, Australia, where we have monuments to celebrate like colonial explorers who might have perpetrated violence against indigenous Australians, then we have to think, what does it mean to be an indigenous person and walk past a monument? That's like violence itself, you know? You walk past a monument that celebrates somebody who 
destroy your culture or your people. So there's a violence potentially to monuments themselves. What's an alternative? I'm not sure. Yesterday in the car after the conference, we were also discussing should we just totally leave museums? Should we totally leave monuments? Can you ever escape them? Um, I'm not sure if people can think of more positive monuments where, um, but I would say the meaning of monuments can change over time. I don't know what the alternative is, and there are certainly debates across Europe should we take down the monument, and Australia, should we take down the monument or leave it there as a reminder of what we once celebrated? But in my own country, a lot of memory work is going on also to rename places, streets, rivers that have been named sometimes in very racist ways. And that reflects colonialism, that there's a process now of undoing this naming uh, and challenging monuments, and even challenging you know, particular fictional stories that sometimes celebrate a very white colonial past. So I often take inspiration from what's happening in my own country, actually. Where there's a lot of challenges as well. And people would say colonialism in my own country as a settler colony is like an ongoing process as well. So it's very present, I guess, as well. Yeah, thank you for the question. Good morning, and my name is Hafid, and I'm from Agata Duatiga. And I have a question about when the VOC decided to look for spies, why did they choose Indonesia instead of India? Considering they got really strong economy at the moment, like they got no tax in the all all over the Europe, and maybe they could set up a higher tax for the bridges so they got no economy. And maybe they could start a war with the British in India, which is they got as a better price and a closer location to Europe. Thank you. Why did the Dutch come to Indonesia? This might be a question for <laughs> This is empirical history. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I can best answer that. I think all European powers were looking for territories that were not occupied, like it was a race for territory across Asia and Africa. So perhaps uh, the Dutch believed that um, this was a colony or a territory that they could take. Um, but also, originally the VOC began as a trading company looking for particular spices, so it's also about what they knew was in Indonesia. But I really think what he can answer this question better than me. So, discuss it in class, you'll learn the... <laughs> Cases, you know, you 
might lose a record like that, or the records of plantations, they will be from the perspective of the plantation themselves. So you need to dig at that history and use a very critical lens, but many scholars have done this, um, to apply like critical archive studies. In addition, oral history where there are surviving people alive or even children of plantation workers could be a very interesting perspective um, because you're right, maybe the workers wouldn't have written down their experiences. But also those fingerprint records tell me a lot about the way the workers were controlled, but maybe even the background of the city. There are a lot of Javanese workers on those plantations in Sumatra, so we might learn more about the general picture of the city um, or forms of revolt because it mentioned that insubordination was something recorded on those documents. So as historians, one of the most exciting things about our job is we can also be creative. We have to find a way in to find our story, even though it's hard. We have to find a way in to find these hidden, interesting stories. I think. Baik, memasuki acara terakhir yakni penutup. Saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada pembicara dan peserta yang telah hadir dalam kuliah perdana hari ini. Saya selaku pembawa acara memohon maaf atas kesalahan perkataan maupun perbuatan. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Namo Buddhaya, salam kebajikan untuk kita semua Selamat siang